tuned in with the Underground Christian Network. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, am I on? Yep, I guess I am. Shall I move it up a little? Um, just out of curiosity, how many of you get our newsletter, the Brian Cole? Oh, well, quite a few. My goodness. You'd be interested to know, uh, we were just, just came from Romania. Wherever we go in the world, it's amazing. People get the Brian Cole. It's astonishing. Uh, places that I've never been and never even heard of. <laughs> Somehow they're getting it. Um, if you don't get it and would like to, we send it out free each month and there's a sign-up sheet back there about where Hutch is. I think he's sitting on them right now. <laughs> um, well, um, a number of people ask me why I'm limping so badly. And so that I don't have to keep telling everybody individually, uh, I might as well explain it to everybody. You know, you find yourself in a situation sometimes, you don't know how you got in it, and you wish you hadn't, and you don't know how to get out of it. And that's kind of what happened to me. I was in Texas, of all places, and I came out of a store, and there was a horse there. It's not unusual for Texas, but it was a rather beautiful one. And I, my first mistake was commenting on what a beautiful horse it was. And the next thing I knew, they talked me into getting on it with a cowboy hat, of course, just to get my picture taken. Uh, well, when the flash went off, <laughs> up went the rear, up went the front, up went the middle. And this thing is going through gyrations. Fortunately, there was a horn there, you know, and I'm hanging on for dear life, but I'm not a rodeo rider. And I, I got thrown off. And I survived that, but my left foot was caught in the stirrup. And the hoofs are going like this. All I can do is scream for help. And fortunately, the Walmart manager heard me and ran out and pulled the plug. Well, I was just trying to show you how easy it is to deceive you. <clears throat> and that kind of uh, ties in with our uh, topic for this evening. Um, let's open the Bible and turn to Matthew 24. Let's just ask the Lord to guide us. Father, thank you for your word, for your love and mercy to us. And now we ask that you will speak to our hearts from it and make it somehow useful in our lives and help us to put into practice what you teach us. And may we have an impact uh, in the world where you've placed us. In these last days, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This is a prophecy conference, I, I understand. And when you think about prophecy, uh, probably one of the things you think about, first of all, is some of the signs of the last days. And, of course, that's what the disciples asked Jesus about here, Matthew 24. Uh, it's one of the things that actually started me writing books. I never intended to write books, um, but uh, 20 some years ago, the Lord somehow got me started in it because I noticed that preachers were talking about it from pulpits and books were being written about the signs of the end, wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes, pestilence, famine, and so forth. Those are the things that you would ordinarily think of. But the major sign that Christ gave, the first sign that he gave, the one he emphasized three times in this chapter was being overlooked and that's really what started me writing books <laughs> uh, investigating and so forth and um, our topic this evening is re re I think it is revival or apostasy uh, it might shock some of you and I don't want to get into that right now and I probably shouldn't even say it 
but it might shock some of you to know that the word revival isn't even in the Bible. At least not in the King James Bible. The word revived is there a half a dozen times in the Old Testament, meaning the re- Israel being revived or someone revived from the dead. Revive us, O Lord, uh, referring to Israel. But uh, I don't find it, and I'm not here to talk against revival. I want to see God move and work in power and souls be saved uh, and his church built up and really living for Christ. I want that as much as anyone else. We also want to be biblical. But you hear a lot about revival today. We are supposedly, if you listen to Christian, uh, watch Christian television, Christian radio, we're supposedly in the midst of or about to begin at least the greatest revival in the history of of the church. That's what you hear over and over. Uh, and of course, that's what Jesus said here. He's, you know, uh, verse 3, they want to know the, the signs. Uh, Tell us when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming, the end of the world, and so forth? And Jesus answered and said, Why, well, you'll know the nearness of my return because you'll have a great revival. Uh, it'd be the greatest revival, it'd be the climax of the church age be a great revival. Is that what he says? Verse 4. Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. Verse 11. Many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. Verse 24. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. He uses the word deceive over and over. He uses the word many a number of times. Doesn't sound to me like this is some little thing uh, going off in a, going on in a corner. It sounds like a worldwide movement. Many false prophets will deceive many. Now, by the way, since this is a prophecy conference, um, just uh, going back for a moment and we'll get back on with what we're talking about here. But the disciples, you remember, in verse 1, they show Jesus the temple. I guess they thought he would be impressed. I mean, after all, he's God. It was built for him. Uh, And in verse 2, Jesus shocks them. He tells them that there won't be one stone left upon another. That shocks them. Now, you prophecy experts, what would your reaction have been? If Jesus said, the temple is going to be destroyed, well, obviously, then the city must be destroyed. You can't get to the temple without knocking down the walls of the city and so forth. What would your reaction have been? You should have said, praise God, you must be the Messiah. I'm trying to get you to think. Isn't that right? Isn't that what the Bible said? Daniel chapter 9 said the Messiah would come and then the people of the prince who would come would destroy the city and the sanctuary. So that the Messiah had to come just before the city and the sanctuary would be destroyed. And if the city and the temple were not going to be destroyed after Jesus came, then he wasn't the Messiah. You see the importance of knowing prophecy. No wonder to the two on the road to Emmaus, Jesus, you know, he somehow, he hadn't had a Dale Carnegie course on how to win friends and influence people. If if he had been as positive as Robert Schuller, he wouldn't have even been crucified. Uh, just think of the followers he could have had. But Jesus, Jesus said to them, fools, fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Don't you know what the prophets said? If you knew what the prophets said, you would know who I am. And you wouldn't be uh, downhearted and discouraged and disillusioned because I was crucified, thinking that that proved that I'm not the Messiah. You would know that the Messiah had to be crucified because that's what the prophets foretold. Well, but that's not the direction we want to go this evening. Our topic is revival or apostasy. Notice what Jesus said. Verse 24, he is foretelling a last day's great signs and wonders movement. Isn't that true? 
He says they will show great signs and wonders. You want to know the signs of the nearness of my return, Jesus says? You're going to have a great signs and wonders movement. But it's not going to be genuine. It will be false. And it will be machinated, engineered, manipulated, run by false prophets. What does uh, Jude say? Well, we don't have time to turn to all of these verses. But you remember, Jude says, certain men have crept in unawares. Well, first of all, he says, I've written to you that you must earnestly contend for the faith. Once for all, delivered to the saints. Uh, we'll probably come back and talk about some of these things. I may shock some of you a little bit. Um, now, if I, please, if I quote people, don't be upset at me for quoting what they say. Uh, and if they believe what they said, then they ought to be happy that I quote them, shouldn't they? Because I'm only giving broader coverage to what they've said. I don't, I, it puzzles me because sometimes people get upset because I quote somebody. Uh, I remember I quoted, was quoting Robert Schuller uh, in, um, well, it was happened to be First Baptist Church in Dallas. I don't get invited back to these places somehow, for some reason. And I didn't bring it up. Somebody asked the question. In the question and answer time, they said, uh, what do you think about Robert Schuller? And I said, well, rather than telling you what I think about him, let me just tell you what he has said about himself. And um, I said, you know, Robert Schuller went to Unity School of Christianity in Lee's Summit, Missouri. If you don't know anything about Unity School of Christianity, it's one of the worst cults out there. They deny everything in the Bible. They're into reincarnation, psychic powers, UFOs, yoga, spiritism, communication with the dead, uh, a rejection of what the Bible teaches. And I said, you know, Robert Schuller went there not to correct them, but to commend them, to speak to their ministers in training and some of their ministers to share his church growth principles to help unity this cult grow larger. <laughs> and I said in the question and answer time, somebody said, Dr. Schuller, what is the function of a minister in the New Age? And he explained what the New Age is, and he said, of which we're all a part. And I said, Robert Schuller didn't skip a beat. Uh, in fact, I think, I don't know if they have any copies of uh, Selection of Christianity back there on the table, but I give you this quote, which, by the way, if you went to Unity, I got the tape. Uh, I went to Unity and got the tape. If you went there today, they would deny that Robert Schuller had ever been there and said anything. Uh, there's a little problem with truthfulness uh, in some of these areas. Uh, but anyway, Robert Schuller didn't skip a beat. He said, what we have to do in this age for ministers now is we have to positivize religion. And he said, that's very easy for you being unity ministers. You're already very positive. But you understand that I deal with people that you would call, uh, even call fundamentalists. And they use terms like sin and guilt and repentance and redemption. And what we have to do is positivize these terms. And a gentleman came up to me afterwards. A number of people were talking to me. And finally, it was his turn. And he said, I didn't like what you said about Robert Schuller tonight. And I said, what did I say about him? I didn't really say anything. I only quoted what Robert Schuller said. So apparently, you don't like what he said any more than I do. <laughs> So, if I quote some men, and then please don't blame me for what they said, <laughs> okay? Well, you have a horrendous thing that's going on today, or that has gone on, and we'll come back and talk to it and document it in more detail, and we document these things in our newsletter. Uh, but uh, some of you have probably heard of the Templeton Award for Progress in Religion. Incredible. John Marks Templeton, a wealthy Wall Street money manager. You want to know what he believes? <laughs> well, we'll have to come back and talk about it in more detail. But basically, he says, you're God, I'm God, everything is God. The God is the universe. He's a pantheist. 
Uh, he's into science of mind, religious science. He says, you create reality with your own mind. We sent astronauts out into space. They didn't find heaven. We drilled into the earth. They didn't find hell. They found oil. He said, heaven and hell are states of mind that you create and so forth. He says what we need is progress in religion because what we're aiming for, we've got to discover a religion that all the world's religions can accept, that every person on this earth can accept and that all the extraterrestrial beings out there can accept as well. He's talking about the one world religion of the Antichrist. And he says in order to encourage progress to the discovery of this religion, to the development of this religion, I have established the prize the Templeton Award for Progress in Religion. Could you accept such a prize? You couldn't possibly. First of all, Christianity is not a religion. And I'm just about to quote to you Jude verse 3. He says, We must earnestly contend for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. Christianity does not change. There is no progress in Christianity. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the gospel doesn't change. God's truth does not change. And it makes no progress. And furthermore, he's not even talking about Christianity. He's talking about a godless one world religion that all the religions of the world can accept. Now, who do you think took credit for progress toward this religion? Well, Billy Graham was the first one of the evangelicals. Then Charles Colson took the credit. And Bill Bright took the credit in 1996. The 1997 award uh, uh, recipient was a Hindu and so forth. Well, we'll come back and talk about that in a bit more, uh, more later. Uh, tomorrow, God willing, if we get to it. But we, have, uh, we reported these things in our newsletter. And um, uh, several people wrote in. And they were upset. Uh, and they, they said, now, wait a minute. Dwight Moody was walking down the street and a drunk gave him a quarter. <laughs> and his friend said to him, Brother Moody, you're not going to accept the devil's money, are you? And Moody said, the devil's had it long enough. I'm going to use it for the Lord. <laughs> and so they said, so how can you fault these men for taking, well, the prize happens to be larger than the Nobel Prize, over a million dollars. Uh, from John Mark Templeton, no matter what kind of a godless man he may be. I, I wrote back and I said, it's very simple, I'm sorry. The drunk did not award a prize to Moody. He just gave him a gift. John Mark Templeton did not, just out of the goodness of his heart, give a gift to Bill Bright or Charles Colson or Billy Graham. He awarded them a prize for contributing in pro progress toward this world religion. And I wrote to my good friend Bill. I've known Bill and Von Ed Bright for many years. I love them dearly. And I, and I wrote to Bill and I said, look, if the government sent you a check for some amount of money as an award for having rescued a family from a burning building, and the truth is you weren't even near that burning building and you did not rescue anyone out of that building, wouldn't you send that check back to the government. It would be accepting it under false pretenses. It wouldn't be ethical to accept it, would it? And I said, you surely don't believe in this religion that John Marx Templeton believes in. You surely have not contributed toward in pro progress, toward the establishment of this religion. Then how could you possibly accept this award? It's an award for something. Well, we are to earnestly contend for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. Why? Well, because of those atheists out there, those university professors and so forth. No. What does the next verse say? For certain men have crept in unawares. Crept in where? Into the universities? Into industry? No, into the church. And Jesus makes that very clear in Matthew, well, we're close enough. Let's just go back and look at the verses. Matthew 7, you know the verses as well as I do. And perhaps something for all of us to think about this evening. Verse 21, Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven, many 
Here we have that word many again. There's not a small movement. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I don't know, I'm sure some of you here, at least a few of you this evening would disagree with me. I do not believe in falling away. I believe that, you know, Jesus said, I give my sheep eternal life. They will never perish. Then if they could perish, then I don't think he's telling the truth. And furthermore, if I have eternal life today and I don't have it tomorrow, it's not very eternal. Uh, and I could argue it from a lot of uh, directions, but uh, that's, again, not our topic this evening. And probably there would only be very few of you who would disagree with that anyway. But Jesus says, I never knew you. He didn't say things were going really well for you until you fell away. He says, I never knew you. And those are solemn words from the lips of the one who said, I know my sheep and am known of mine. If he never knew them, they were never his sheep. Now think about it for a moment. In his name, calling him Lord. Oh, you say, but wait a minute. The Bible says, no man can call him Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Well, that means that no one can really call him Lord and he is their Lord and mean it in their heart and know him as their Lord except by the Holy Spirit. But people's lips can say anything. A lot of people can call him Lord and he's not their Lord. Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied? These... I, I, can't, I can't interpret it any other way. Jesus says, many false prophets will arise. Well, these must be the ones he's talking about. Here he says, many will say, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? And then, remember, it's a false signs and wonders movement. And he says, and in thy name we cast out devils, and in thy name we've done many wonderful works. It sounds to me like the signs and wonders movement. The false prophets. Now, what is their problem? What is wrong with what they're saying? What would you say to Jesus? Wouldn't you say, but Lord, you died for my sins. You promised. You said, him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. You said, he that believeth on the Son has everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death to life. And Lord, I believed in you. I took you at your word. You know, the old, the, the old hymn, um, nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling, just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. That's what you would say. That's what they should have said. But that was not their emphasis. Their emphasis was upon signs and wonders. Isn't that what we see today? We have, you know, great signs and wonders movement going on. Uh, when we wrote Seduction of Christianity, that was in 1985 it came out. Uh, at my last count, ten different books have been written against it. Uh, to refute it. And it was only a few months after Seduction of Christianity came out that Oral Roberts formed a new organization specifically to counter what we had said in Seduction of, of Christianity. It's called Charismatic Bible Ministries. And you know what the big logo is? You go to their conference in Tulsa each year. You know what the big banner says over the conference, over the platform? It says, Unity and love through signs and wonders. And one of their pledges to one another, those who joined that organization, was we will not correct one another. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord. I mean, these people must pass for Christian leaders. These are men, and maybe women as well, who in the name of the Lord seemingly 
are doing a great work for him. But it's a work that involves signs and wonders. Now, I don't think I'm reading anything into it. I'm not trying to interpret it. But before we get to the signs and wonders movement, uh, apostasy, it's been in the church. You know, I, can't, I can't refute the fact that he's talking about something within the church. When he says, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, haven't we prophesied in thy name and so forth? This isn't Madeline Murray O'Hare. This is not some godless university professor. This is not an atheist. This is not an evolutionist. This is in the church. Certain men have crept in unawares. I, I, can remember, I don't know how many years ago it's been, at least ten years ago, and I used to go to, you know, some of the counter cult ministries is what they called us in those days and and um, have their conferences and so forth. And I'm not opposed to that. But um, I can remember the second one I went to because I was very distressed at the first one. And when I spoke to the group in one of the plenary sessions, I said, you know, I think we're wasting a lot of time here. We come here and we talk about the Moonies and the Mormons, the Jehovah's Witnesses, and all those bad guys out there. And you've got the same problem inside the church. And until we are willing to face what's going on, the apostasy inside the church, the heresy, the false teaching that's leading people astray, I'm not coming back. Because I think we're just bypassing an uncomfortable subject that really needs to be addressed. It, you see, Jesus talks about deception. And what greater deception could you have than apostasy posing as revival? How about that? You remember what A.W. Tozer said, and this is years ago. He said, we don't need revival, we need reformation. He says, if we had a revival of the Christianity that's being lived today, it would set the cause of Christ back at least a hundred years. And I think he would say it would be even worse if, if he were alive today. We need a reformation. Well, we'll come to that tomorrow, perhaps, or the next day. I don't, don't remember when, but we have to get to that because the reformation that took place 450 years ago is being denied. It is being denied. And we have evangelicals and Catholics together. And I won't get into the details of that this evening, but let me just give you the title of that document. It doesn't say... It doesn't qualify evangelicals. It doesn't qualify Catholics. It says evangelicals and Catholics. All evangelicals and all Catholics together. The Christian mission in the third millennium. What is the Christian mission? To preach the gospel. I think uh, John Calvin, uh, certainly Martin Luther, would be astonished that evangelicals are joining with Catholics to evangelize the world. When, according to them, Roman Catholicism is a false gospel. Now, I'm going to document that for you. And, and one of the books back there, A Woman Rides the Beast, if you don't know what Catholicism really is, you would be shocked to read it. And I don't, I don't quote ex-Catholics. I don't quote, uh, I don't think I quote an ex-Catholic in the, in the book. It's 550 pages over 800 footnotes. I don't quote anti-Catholics by any means. I simply quote their own documents. The Catechism, the Universal Catechism. The Council of Trent, Vatican II. The Pope speaks. I, I get every speech that the Pope makes. Uh, the, the Code of Canon Law, it's about that thick. Every Christian ought to have these on, on their shelf. And, you know, I've been called a Catholic basher by Catholics. And um, I get just a little bit upset. And I say, look, don't you dare call me a Catholic basher. I love Catholics. That's why I want them to know the truth. I want them to know the gospel. I want them to be saved. But if you want to know who's been bashing, your church has damned me to hell 
more than a hundred times officially in its documents that are the official teaching of the Roman Catholic Church today. I will just give you one of them. There are more than a hundred in the Council of Trent. And you say, well, the Council of Trent, that's 450 years ago. Yeah, 450th anniversary was just celebrated by the Pope a, 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 a year, a two years ago now, this December. And he said, all the canons and decrees of the Council of Trent are in full force and effect. The latest Catholic Council, Vatican II, held from 1963 to 1965. These are the highest authority of the Catholic Church, the bishops and so forth. Vatican II said, this sacred council proposes again all the canons and decrees of the Council of Trent. Okay, this is the official doctrine today. All right. And I'll give you just one anathema. Whosoever says that the sacraments of the new law are not essential to salvation, but that without them, through faith in Christ alone, a man can be saved, let him be anathema. Did you hear that? If you dare to say that you can be saved by faith in Christ alone without the sacraments of the Roman Catholic Church, anathema to you. Now, don't, please, don't get upset with me. I'm only quoting the official teaching of the Catholic Church. That's all. If you don't like that, then talk to them about it. But don't get upset with me. And furthermore, you know, my dear friend Charles Colson, who is one of the initiators of that, not just a signer, one of the initiators of that document, in his book, The Body, which is basically a call, well, it's a, it's a good book in many ways, but it's also a call for unity with the Catholic Church. He says the Roman Catholic Church is not involved in indulgences anymore. I have sent him, yeah, so you're shocked. I have sent him the 17 pages on indulgences from Vatican II. And let me just quote you part of what it says there. <laughs> this sacred council teaches <laughs> that the practice of indulgences, a practice beneficial to the church and approved by the sacred councils, should be kept in this church. And it anathematizes anyone who denies this. And he says, they don't have indulgences today? Well, I'll bring you, uh, you know, some indulgences maybe tomorrow just to show you exactly what we're talking about. Well, we've got a real problem in the church. And tomorrow we'll talk about, well, isn't apostasy old news? It's been going on for a long time. But there is something new about the apostasy today that I think is a fulfillment of what the Bible tells us. This is a, really an interesting prophecy. Uh, we have a, well, I don't want to get into that. But not tonight. There's something wrong inside the church. Certain men have crept in unawares. Many will say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do it in your name? And they're talking about signs and wonders. But before we even get to the signs and wonders movement, this apostasy has been going on for a long time. And you could, you could mention a number of these people. Now, let's take Norman Vincent Peale. He's dead. I'm not going to try to say, suggest where he may be. But listen to this. Highly honored. His Guidepost magazine. I mean, I'm like a mosquito on an elephant's back, and so is Southwest Radio Church. His writings read by 16 million people a month. Okay? And he was on the... 1984, he was on the Phil Donahue program. And let me just quote him. Dr. Peel said, quote, It's not necessary to be born again. You have your way to God. I have mine. I found eternal peace in a Shinto shrine. I've been to Shinto shrines, and God is everywhere. Phil Donahue was shocked. Christian leaders don't seem to be shocked. They just embraced him and praised him. Phil Donahue was shocked. He said, quote, but you're a Christian minister. You're supposed to tell me that Christ is the way and the truth and the life, aren't you? <laughs> Peel, Peel replied, Christ is one of the ways. God is everywhere. Now, don't, again, I, can't, I have to keep saying, don't be angry with me. 
But Billy Graham was on the Phil Donahue show some months after that. And Billy Graham on the same program said, I know of no one who has done more good for the cause of Christ and the kingdom of God than Ruth and Norman Peel. How could he say that? Norman Vincent Peel said, to give you an idea of what he believed about prayer and faith and so forth, Norman Vincent Peel said, quote, just as there are scientific methods for releasing atomic energy so prayer is a scientific technique for releasing spiritual power. That's Christian science. That's not Bible. If, if prayer is a scientific technique for releasing spiritual power, you don't even have to be a Christian. All you have to do is know the formula. And that is exactly what Paul Yonggi Cho teaches, or David Yonggi Cho, he calls himself now, the pastor of the largest church in the world over there in Seoul, Korea. He teaches exactly that. If you know the laws of the fourth dimension, you can. if you're an occultist, he says, I ask God, how come the Soka Gakkai, the Jichiren Shoshu, this Buddhist occult group, how come they're getting miracles? And he says, God said to me, it's because they're spirit beings, just like Christians are spirit beings, and they're simply developing God's laws of the fourth dimension. Now, if it works scientifically, then you don't even have to be a Christian to do it, right? And that's exactly what he says. Kenneth Hagin says the same thing in his little book with having faith in your faith. He says, it used to bother me when I saw sinners getting miracles and my church members missing out. And he says, I asked the Lord, why is that? And he said, well, they're just developing God's laws of faith. Amazing. Faith, of course, of, maybe some of you this evening have a misunderstanding about faith. What is faith? Well, faith is, if, if I'm praying for something, if I can just believe that it will happen, if I can just really believe that it's going to happen, then, then it will happen. But if I can just get that faith, that's not faith. That's mind power. If things happen because you believe they will happen, you don't need God, Right? What is faith? Faith is believing that God will make it happen. Jesus said, have faith in God. Kenneth Hagin titles his book, Having Faith in Your Faith. Okay? Uh, look, I'm not, I'm not trying to run these people down, please. I'm just telling you what they teach. And again, I, I must say, it, don't blame me for what they teach. And please don't blame me for telling you what they teach. Because if they really believe what they teach, then they ought to be happy that I'm telling you what they teach. Isn't that giving broader coverage to what they believe? And if they really stand behind it, then they couldn't have any objection uh, to, you know, to publicizing what they teach. These men teach that faith is, in Hebrews 11, verse 3, it says, by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So that things which are seen were not made of things that do appear. They turn it around. They are not Greek scholars, Hebrew scholars. I'm sorry that they're rather ignorant men in many ways. I mean, they take, um, for example, they take Matthew 18 where it says, if two of you shall agree as touching anything. That's an old English expression that has nothing to do with touching anything. It simply means regarding any, something, right? But they take that as a point of contact. You know, they'll send you out an outline of their hand, touch that, that's our point of contact. Reach out and touch the, the television, that's our point of contact. This whole point of contact teaching of Oral Roberts and the rest of them comes from a misunderstanding of a simple statement that Jesus made, if two of you shall agree as touching anything. That means two of you agree concerning something. And they say, but no, it's not. It doesn't mean... By faith we understand the worlds were framed by the word of God. What it says is we understand it was by faith that God framed the worlds. You see what they've done? They've turned faith into a force that God used to create the world. And you can do it too because you're a little God. And all you have to do is speak this positive word. Speak this word of power. Do they teach that we're little gods? And who teaches that we're little gods? Well, I'll just give you some quotations. This is just a, every, I just finished a book and it turned out to be 800 pages and we've got to somehow cut it down a little bit. Um, 
but uh, with about 1,500 footnotes. But uh, it's called The Occult, Occult Invasion, subtitled The Subtle Seduction of the World and Church. It's about the world and the church. And each chapter begins with, uh, on, one, on the left side of the page, just a page filled with quotes, just to begin the, pa- the, the chapter. Let me just read you off of this one page here. I will be like the Most High. You know who said that? Lucifer. This is, I'll, I'll tell you who said it first so you'll know as I read it. This is from the Science of Mind magazine. Uh, affirmation you make. Today, I lay claim to all the attributes of God and as a divine being, I rejoice in my divine nature. They believe the lie. I'm quoting Way Davis, an anthropologist. He says, quote, As the Haitians say, the Voodoonist dances in the Hunfur to become God. It's in all the religions, this lie of the serpent. Now, I'm quoting Christophorus Stavropoulos, Orthodox scholar. He's explaining the heart of Eastern Orthodoxy, which is basically the same as Roman Catholicism. They didn't split up until 1054 A.D., when uh, Pope Leo IX excommunicated Michael Cellularius, the, the um, patriarch of Constantinople, and that split them up into two at that time. Uh, and he says, quote, For the Son of God became man so that we might become God. The only begotten Son of God, wanting to make us sharers in his divinity, assumed our nature so that he made man... Oh, I'm sorry, whoops... Oh, I have to finish it now. So that he made man might make men gods. That happens to come from the catechism of the Roman Catholic Church. That's today. Let me go back and quote from the the Orthodox scholar. He says, quote, In the Holy Scriptures, we read of a unique call directed to us. You are gods, all of you. As human beings, we each have this one unique calling to achieve theosis. We're each destined to become a god, to be like God himself. Now I'm quoting Pope John Paul II uh, from uh, his, his book, uh, um, Crossing the Threshold of, of Hope, which is high on the bestseller list for evangelicals. He says, quote, man is called to cooperate with God in his salvation and divinization. The divinization of man comes from God. You know, Jeremiah 10, verses 10 and 11, God says, I am the true God, the creator of heaven and earth. And you say to those gods, spelled with a little g, who have not made the heavens and the earth, they will perish from under this heaven and from this earth. Anyone who claims to be God, I mean, there's only one true God, right? Therefore, if you claim to be God, you can only claim to be a false God. And these people say, but we're little gods. Well, you know, Morris Cirillo says, When you look at me, you don't see more Cirillo. You see Jesus Christ. Um, Here is John Klimo, and I'm quoting a New Age leader now in his book, Channeling. And he says, all of the channels, that is the demons who are speaking through all of these mediums. He says, eventually, all perspectives lead us to return to the truth of truths that we are God. Well, You can find it everywhere. This is the lie that the whole world is being set up uh, to believe. Well, I'm taking too long. Robert Schuller, he claims Norman Vincent Peale as his mentor. And, by the way, he claims Bill Hybels as his chief disciple. Uh, And I give you that quote in the book as well, where Robert Schuller says that Bill Hybels has exceeded the master. He's done it even better uh, than I could do it. Well, but Billy Graham has praised both Robert Schuller and Norman Vincent Peale on many occasions. Why would he do that? The Signs and Wonders Movement. Wow, time flies. What's the... If you think of the Signs and Wonders Movement, what would you think of? What do you think of Benny Hinn? We're talking about false prophets. Uh, Is he a false prophet? Uh, Well, I'll just give you quickly a couple of his false prophecies. This was... the I mean, there are many of them. 
This is a late night service. Look, I'm not trying to run these people down. But if Jesus warned about false prophets and he said, many will say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do this in your name? And he warned us about this. Then I think we ought to be alert to someone who might possibly fit in that category. And perhaps we ought to even identify them to warn others. And Benny Hinn, December 31st, 1989, their late night watch night service. He said, quote, the Lord also tells me to tell you about 94 or 95, no later than that, God will destroy the homosexual community of America. He will destroy it with fire. Well, we passed that time. He said, no later than that. This is God speaking. He claimed to be in the throne room of God. Uh, he said, quote, that same evening, Canada will be visited with a mighty revival that will start on the west coast of British Columbia. It will break loose in the next three years. That would have been by 1992. He can't even take credit for the Toronto Laughing Revival because it didn't start on the West Coast. It started in Toronto. Uh, well, there are other ones, but uh, he over and over that night, as he's giving these false prophecies, he says, quote, the Spirit of God tells me, the Lord says, uh, you know, he's right in the throne room of God and so forth. <clears throat> well, Deuteronomy 18.22 says, if the thing does not come to pass, that is the thing the Lord has not spoken the prophet has spoken it presumptuously. It's a false prophecy. Benny Hinn can't even get his testimony straight. Uh, he, in a 1983 message in St. Louis, he said it was in Canada that I was born again right after 68. But in a PTL family devotional, he says I got saved in Israel in 1968. And in Good Morning Holy Spirit, he says he was converted in 1972, quote, during my senior year of high school. The problem is he dropped out after the 11th grade. <laughs> I'm, I'm not trying to be funny, but someone who can't even get his testimony straight and who lies and who makes false prophecies and yet... He's one of the most popular men on television. And his books sell by the hundreds of thousands. His book, The Anointing and Good Morning Holy Spirit. Where does he get the anointing? He says the anointing is lingering at the graves of Catherine Kuhlman and Amy Semple McPherson. And he goes to their graves to pick up the anointing. You're shocked. But I'm more shocked that people follow these men. Signs and wonders, false prophecies. Well, uh, something was said earlier. Brother Lamb said something about about Pat Robertson. And I want to, well, I don't know whether I can correct him, but I'm correcting him from memory. It was not $1.6 I think it was $1.9 uh, And ask him, write to him and ask him, How is it, Pat? In your book, Shouted from the Housetops, you tell... The story very clearly how you began CBN with $70. That's all you had. And how God graciously moved the hearts of millions of his people to send in money so that you could build up this network and buy the family channel. And they gave you this money thinking that the family channel, as you said, would be used for the propagation of the gospel. And then you took John Ankerberg off. You took everybody off of the family channel so you could have secular programs on there and get the money from the commercials. And then you sold it for one point nine billion to Fox, a godless organization. And how did you come up with the authority to sell this? And how did you end up as the one in control of something that they put up the money for you to use for the propagation of the gospel? Good question. You remember when Pat ran for president? Talk about false prophecies. Well, he said that God told him that he was going to become president. And you could read this in a, in a Charisma magazine interview, and it astonishes me that they would even have the, that they would publish the interview. Because you will gasp when I tell you what he said. The interviewer, Bob Schlosser, who wrote some books with him, said, well, how is it then? If you say that God told you that you were going to become president, how is it you didn't even get the Republican nomination? And Pat said, well, you would have to ask that of Jesus too. How come he failed the first time around and got crucified? Pat has been going 
on a false prophecy that was given to him in May of 1968 by the man that I call the false prophet in residence of CBN, Harold Bredesen. And he says, well, I won't give you all the prophecy, but here's how it concluded. God is speaking now through Harold Bredesen and he's speaking to Pat and he says, for I have chosen you to usher in the coming of my son. I don't think we would agree with that here at this prophecy conference. And he doesn't mean the rapture. He means the second coming. Uh, Pat says in his book, he says, quote, applause burst forth from every corner of the room. I was absolutely awestruck. God had privileged CBN to help prepare the way for Jesus' second coming. Regardless of where God led me, CBN had a mandate to fulfill that of spreading the gospel of his kingdom, of being part of a great company that would help to usher in the very second coming of Jesus. This was to remain CBN's mission. Now, I, I think it's been referred to, and I, I got here late this afternoon, and I didn't hear everything that went on, but I think Brother uh, Noah referred to it, at, at least in, in part. Uh, the Reconstructionists, the Kingdom Dominionists, the Kingdom Now. Uh, these people don't believe in the rapture. They believe that the church must take over the world. And when we've taken over the world, that's why he wanted to run for president. We've got to get them voted in in high political office. We're going to take over the media. We're going to take over the schools. We're going to take over everything. Wasn't that what Jesus said? Go out in all the world and take it over? Uh, no, I, I don't remember re- remember that one. I thought he told us to preach the gospel to call people out of this world for heavenly citizenship. But, you know, and then they believe when we've taken over the world, then Christ will return. Not to rapture us to heaven, but to rule over the kingdom we've established. We don't have to be too bright to realize that if the real Jesus is going to catch us up, that's what it says, the dead in Christ will rise first, we who are alive remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. And you're looking forward to meeting a Christ who when you meet him, your feet are planted on planet earth. And he didn't come to rapture you to heaven. He came to rule over the kingdom you've established for him. You've been working for Antichrist. That's the problem today. Uh, John Wimber, if you think of signs and wonders, you would think of power evangelism. John Wimber wrote the book. The Vineyard Movement. I know the Vineyard from the very beginning and I'm running out of time, so I can't give you the details of that. But I can tell you that the crisis came because John Wimber was not the founder of the Vineyards. I know the Vineyards uh, from before John Wimber. But... The crisis came at a meeting between Chuck Smith and John Wimber at a place called Twin Peaks, which is a Calvary Chapel conference center in Southern California near Lake Arrowhead. And Chuck Smith was very concerned about what was going on, the signs and wonders that were happening in in Wimber's, because John Wimber had a large Calvary Chapel. And finally, Chuck said to John, are you going to go by the Bible or are you going to go by experience? John Wimber said, we're going to go by experience. If it works, that's what we're going to do. And that was when Chuck Smith said, then please don't use the name Calvary Chapel anymore. And that was when he changed the name to Vineyard and joined the Vineyards and he was larger than they were and he'd been teaching signs and wonders at Fuller School of of Theology and so forth. And so he became known as the founder of the Vineyard Movement when in fact it wasn't the case. Now, the Vineyard Movement, John Wimber, have given us a lot of false prophecies, the Kansas City prophets, and I don't have time to go into Paul Cain, uh, and um, uh, incredible false movements. They gave us the Toronto Laughing Revival, which has moved down to Pensacola, Florida, the Brownsville Assembly of God. The same thing under another cover. I met with uh, with some of the the leaders from down there recently, and I said to them, I have watched a half a dozen of your tapes. I haven't been there. I've been to Toronto, but I haven't been to Brownsville but I've watched tapes of your services I said I haven't heard the gospel preached yet I watched one service and I heard the choir sing our God is an awesome God our God is an awesome God our God is an awesome God just those words by the way I could really launch off into something we have changed the great hymns of the faith for shallow repetitive choruses I love to praise you Lord I love to praise you Lord I love to praise you Lord but then I say why don't you praise him and, and praise has some content to it. We're in love with love. We're praising praise and we're worshiping worship. That's the problem. And Christ is not in it because there's nothing about him in it. And it's more the, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't want to be critical, but it's more the beat than the words. And they become very shallow and, and, and repetitive. Well, I forgot what I was saying. What was I saying at that point? <laughs> I got off on something. 
Oh, yeah, Brian, right, right. So I heard the, the, the choir just sing, Our God is an awesome God. Just those words. Over and over hundreds of times. I couldn't count how many times. And then Steve Hill, the evangelist, said, I'm going to do something unusual tonight. I'm not going to even preach the gospel because we've already heard it. Well, all I had heard was two testimonies, a testimony that was, came by letter, read by the pastor's wife, of a pastor and his wife who came to Brownsville and got it. And they were laughing so hard all the way back to Michigan that they were embarrassed in the motel at night. What people on each side of them would think and they couldn't stop it. So that was one testimony. The other testimony was about a 12-year-old girl and her friend who had been very retiring. She got it. And she said, oh, fancy. And, and the, the parents could hardly get her into the car. They could hardly get her across the lawn into her house. And she'd gone all night. And just Now, that was the gospel that we heard. And then there was the call to come forward. And hundreds of people came forward to get what? I said, you know, I haven't heard the gospel yet. Would you guys? Well, they said, well, that's very unusual. I said, would you please send me some videos then that have the gospel in it? They promised to, but I haven't received them yet. And that's months ago. I watched the baptism, I said. I watched your baptismal service, a whole hour of it. And people were going through such contortions. You couldn't do that with a normal body. It looked more like demonic possession to me. It wasn't glorifying to the Lord. It took several strong men to control them and get them out of the baptismal tank. And some of them would have drowned if you hadn't had people there. The ones that weren't going like this were swooning, uh, gone off on a trip or something. And I said, I just don't... Look, I said, I'm not saying that there haven't been some lives changed. I'm not saying that some people haven't gotten saved. But what I'm saying is, all that I have ever seen on the videos that you've sent me are not glorifying the Lord. And I don't find the gospel. I don't find doctrinal teaching. I don't find the truth of the Word of God. I find people who are out for some experience. And we don't have time to deal with it, but what does that bring us to? What, what do they think of when they think of revival? This is the greatest revival on the earth today. Brownsville, Assembly of God in Pensacola, Florida. But what, what do they mean by revival? Unusual manifestation. Unusual signs and wonders and so forth, they don't mean good, solid teaching from the Word of God. The Word of God is living and powerful. It will change lives. Don't we have the Word of God? Are we not indwelt by the Holy Spirit? You don't have to do what John Wimber says. Come on, Holy Spirit. Come on. We're giving you permission now. Do your thing. No. Where two or three are gathered together, I'm there in their midst. We need to get back to the Word of God, the truth, the truth of God. Well, I just brought a whole lot of other things, but... I've got to stop. They gave me extra time. False Prophecies by Kenneth Copeland. Uh, Kenneth Copeland said, this is in 1975, he said, as you move into the month of January, you will see more of the outpouring of God's glory than you've ever seen in the history of this world and so forth. Limbs will be re restored. You know there are false prophecies in the vineyard about stadiums being filled. You know that that's what uh, Promise Keepers is a fulfillment of those prophecies. Uh, the Vineyard gave us Promise Keepers movement and I, I don't want to get into that. I'm going to get into it in more detail uh, tomorrow or, or the next night. But I would just say this basically. I don't want to be critical of Promise Keepers. I think these people love the Lord. They, they want to serve the Lord. They want to see souls saved. But just logically, just, let's just be logical and give me about one more minute here just to be logical. It's not a new movement. The first Promise Keepers meeting was held, I don't know, 3,500 years ago or more. At the base of Mount Sinai, wasn't it? Isn't that where God gave Ten Commandments and they promised to keep them? And they couldn't? Now, what, there's nothing wrong with the Ten Commandments. The problem is we can't keep them. So now, what good will seven more do? And by... Please, I'm not trying to run these people down, but I'm just trying to be logical and biblical. By whose authority do we have these seven? And by whose authority can they dare to say that spiritual growth begins with a commitment to keep these seven promises? And you want to know what some of them are. Promise number five. In that audience, you can have men from apostate... There are apostate Protestant churches, right? And there are Catholics in that audience wearing scapulars praying to Mary into all kinds of abominations and you cannot tell anyone that anything is wrong. And promise number five says, 
all of you men will go back and support your church and your pastor. We have a full support of everything that's wrong out there and of the Catholic Church, uh, but we'll document that further for you. Uh, I think we've got some problems. And Jesus warned, don't let anyone deceive you. We didn't get to Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Come on, brother. We didn't get to Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, where Paul, what does Paul say? Go back and read it. Don't let anybody deceive you with sweet talk about revival in the last days. Apostasy must come. Apostasy must come. I'm not trying to be negative. I'm just reading what the Bible says. And I think we need to be alert to what the Word of God says. And then we need to stand true to the Word of God and not be swept up in the emotion of the moment into false movements and to follow false prophets and false signs and wonders. Father, help us to remain true to your word, we pray, and use us to your glory. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You're tuned in with the Underground Christian Network.